because I jumped into it, I think, the way a lot of people do, which is just wanting to do direct impact, dig well, raise money for well projects. And, and, um, and as I started to learn more about it, um, I, I decided I needed to partner with, with kind of the preeminent expert in the space and, and um, if I was going to maximize my impact. And that's, that's what led me to, to Gary. How severe is the water crisis around the world? I mean, put it in perspective for us. We hear, you know, bits and pieces, the crisis in India, parts of Latin America, South America. But really, when we look at it on a global scale, how staggering are these numbers? Well, there's, there's the numbers, right? And about 740 million people lack access to improved water supplies and about 2.5 billion lack access to sanitation. But then you start peeling that back and what it means in terms of people's everyday lives. Uh, it, it basically holds back economic development. It shaves percentage points off of GMP. You've traveled all over the world. You've both been doing this for a very long time. Matt, what country or city really sort of shocked you when you went there uh, on your water mission? What we believe is that we've been looking at this wrong with a kind of a top-down approach and viewing the extremely poor people on, on the planet as beneficiaries, whereas we should just view them as customers and citizens. Um, and, and that if you give them the tools, they can participate in their, in, in this, in, in their own solutions. And, and that's what we found with our water credit program. So it's just that there's so much economic potential to be unleashed at the base of the pyramid. There's so many good ideas and so many things that people can do with capital to improve their lives or to generate income. It's really, you know, a wide open field to, to spur economic development. The bulk of your work is in developing countries across Latin America, Asia, Africa. Those countries in itself pose huge economic and political challenges. What are some of the roadblocks that you encounter when you work out there? It's funny that when we were in, in India last year, the, um, we asked that question to all of our microfinance partners who were on the ground there, and every single one of them came back with the same answer, which was access to affordable capital. That was, yeah, they, they, they felt the, the appetite was there for, for we, we could do many more of these things. But the problem a lot of the time is these, these wholesale loans are, are being are given at about 15%, right, which is nuts if you think about what we could get a, you know, take a loan out for right now. Are you talking about loan sharking? No, this is, these are the commercial banks loaning yeah, to the MFIs. Yeah, and inflation's so high. Yes, there's, there's that's a little right. Bit of an edge to and, then they have, and then to keep their lights on, they add their 10%. Or, you know, so these loans are going out to the extremely poor at 25%, um, which is nuts if you think about it. It's the phrase we always say is it's, it's expensive to be poor. How can businesses and governments uh, and NGOs all work together to have maximum impact in helping combat the global water crisis? Well, I think it kind of goes back to some of those roadblocks. I mean, even in India, when we were there meeting with uh, some of the, the regulatory agencies, looking at some of the policies that can hinder lending for water and sanitation, the fact that it's not seen as income generating, mm -hmm. so it kind of gets some discriminatory practices uh, from the regulatory agency, so banks have to loan more for income generating projects and it's not part of their priority sector lending. So there's a lot of kind of regulatory things that governments I think can do to clear the way for lending for these things. I think governments can do much more in terms of extending kind of the infrastructure into the slums so that when poor people show up and say, yes, I want a house connection and I'm willing to pay for it, that there's actually infrastructure there and so that they can use their water credit loan to, to tie into that. So there's a lot of coordination that has to happen at the municipal level all the way up to the national so level. So there's no silver bullet, really? No, yeah. no, uh, yeah, and, and that's, I think, when I got into this, and I think when a lot of people do, that's what everyone's looking for, you know. Is there a filter? Is there a, is there a pill you drop into, the, into dirty water to make it clean? Is there, you know, that's yeah. gonna solve everything, and it's just much more complex than that, and it is gonna take coordination between NGOs and, 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 and governments and business and, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's an all hands on deck type of attack that, that is required. We are in the midst, in the thick of a social media revolution. What impact do you think social media can have in terms of helping solve the water crisis? I think, we're, I, I think we don't even understand yet the impact that it, that, you know, the potential. And I think that's really exciting. And, um, and, and something that we continue to try to, to, uh, you know, to engage with and what does it mean that we're all connected and how can we, um, I think the Ice Bucket Challenge is a great example, but that's, I think we're in our, our, our infancy in terms of our understanding of how to, how to leverage that. Yeah. And I think 
looking at it from that perspective of raising awareness and kind of what I call the upstream where we're trying to reach audiences in the U.S. and Europe and other places to help, but also what's the power of social media on the downstream by helping give people in these slums more access to information about the water supply, you know, water quality, you know, what are happening to the investments that they're supposed to be targeting some of the poor communities from the World Bank and other investors. I think the, the transparency tools that kind of can go along with social media, as we saw, you know, during the Arab Spring and other places, that's very much in the early stage is how that might contribute to people getting more uh, improved services from their government. So it's almost as if social media will hold certain companies and governments and agencies accountable? Absolutely, yeah. Well, more people on the planet have a cell phone than have access to a toilet. So, you know, that's... that's staggering? It's staggering, but it's also good news in the sense that we, we are becoming more connected. And so n knowledge is more available to, to all of us. And so that is going to lead people to hold their governments accountable mm -hmm. for the promises that they make. You know, there's no, you, you, can't, you can't lie to somebody in some rural area anymore and get away with it. They'll know? read it on You're their connected. cell phone. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs>